Hello everybody, welcome to the next episode in our scenario guide for new players of Arkham Horror the Guard Game. This time I'm not alone, I'm here with the usual Arkham crew, Travis and Bryn, and we are excited to talk to you guys about how the heck you win, or at the very least have a better chance of winning, in the Midnight Masks. Wow. This is a great scenario, first off. It stays as one of the best scenarios in the game. Uh, and this one, it's not really so much about winning. It's not like The Gathering, where you have a very easily achievable goal, especially in the long term. Uh, people will think that true victory is finding all six of the unique cultists that you need to find. But that's, uh, that's kind of tough to do. Uh, so then, for I think what I want to start with is what do you guys think is the number of cultists that the players should feel like they've accomplished in getting? What should be the baseline goal? And then everything else above that is gravy. Like the baseline achievable goal where you feel like you had a good run in the Midnight Masks. I'm usually trying to trying to find three. Yeah, I, can get I was going to say four. three or more. I, f I feel like I'm doing pretty okay. Yeah, like I wouldn't find I wouldn't be unhappy about finding three, but like I would be happy to get four. Yeah, I think I'm with like four is where I feel like I've won the scenario. And three is like, you're still good. Like three is still good, but four is like, when you get four, you're like, the next scenario is gonna be it. a lot easier. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like I wouldn't I wouldn't walk away just because I'd found three and I was like, well, there's two, I could play two more turns or another turn and maybe get another one. Yeah. So there's actually only one act card for the Midnight Mask and that's uncovering the conspiracy. And it just has uh, an action, the investigator spend two clues per investigator as a group to draw the top card of the cultist deck. I haven't grabbed the cultist yet, I should do that, so let me just quickly pull out these guys. Because they are going to be relevant throughout the whole thing, and they are like your goal for this scenario. So yeah, there's five cultists in this deck, but there are six cultists to kill. Um, we recommend that you don't, uh, if you're watching this video and you haven't played Midnight Masks, my recommendation is your first time through Arkham, just get the crap beat out of you, right? If you lose a scenario because you don't know what things are coming, that's the point of the game. However, if you're revisiting a scenario and you want some tips of what to win, this is the video to watch for that. So you're gonna be kind of going around the city, grabbing clues, and this scenario is built for that the clues will be taken away from you constantly. So it's kind of like that struggle while balancing out the threats that come up in the board. Um, we'll get to the cultists, but let's just kind of look at everything else. Uh, you only advance this if you collect all six cultists, which I've never done. Have you done it, either of you? Uh, yeah, I mean, like, I've done it. I've done it playing, like, true solo, but... Mm. I'm pretty sure I've, I've done it two-handed. Yeah. yeah, like, Yorick's, like, vaguely broken, so... <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think I've... I could have done it. I don't remember it. I, my best is yeah. five. I think that's... Yeah, like, I used to run this scenario a lot. Yeah, it's, it's the one we use for testing our decks out, because it just covers a bit of everything. So, yeah, this is pretty straightforward. Uh, the agenda, you have six Doom, and when it advances, you are introduced to... Uh, one of the biggest plot twists in your first playing this game, which is, oh my god, there's a monster on the other side? Uh, so this is one of the six cultists that are not the five set aside at the beginning. Uh, and this is the one that you're going to want to ensure that you kill each time. So if you're playing and your th idea is, I'm just going to avoid this dude, it's going to make this whole scenario a lot harder for you. That's my thought on it anyway, because he's going to be following you around. But not only that, he's going to be, he goes with the person who has the most clues. So the person who's not really capable of fighting. And then he will follow that person around whenever he has the opportunity to. Yeah, when you, when you know this guy's coming at the end of the first, uh, the first agenda, this scenario gets a little bit easier. Exactly that. So, so to the yeah. point that if you're looking to do better, when you know that you're about to flip this over, just get your goon near your clue getter, the, the person who has the clues, because then you don't even need to, you're just gonna be pre prepared for when he shows up. So when that is about to advance, just move your, the guy who fights the monsters, the enemies, 
with your clue getter or whoever has the most clues. If there's some chance that someone else has it, mm -hmm. it's unlikely. Um, it's also possible that you might be able to manipulate the clue counts. Yes. So that the person who is supposed to fight the monsters will have the most when this guy spawns. Yeah, and then you have basically just you've beat one of the biggest twists that this game does to this scenario does to hinder the players further. So controlling that is a very good option. And as you can do it in the, in the way Bryn said, which I think is really clean, especially if you can spawn another cultist and be like, this is easy. You solve him and I'll go deal with the other cultist that just spawned. Mm -hmm. uh, after this, you have eight doom to uh, gather as many cultists as you can. Uh, and there is the action to resign. You don't want to risk taking too long, so you head to safety with the information you've gathered. Uh, you do want to resign before this um, resolves if you are playing on campaign mode. If you're playing on standalone mode, who cares? Yeah, um, yeah do whatever. But this will punish you if you um, don't resign. So you're going to want to do that. Yeah. It's also not, like, the end of the world. It's true. If you don't, it's occasionally worth risking, like, a, risking another turn yeah, to get, you, get an extra get cultist. cultist. Like, so is it worth it getting the six cultists but having time run out? I would say it if is. You get, if you get the six cultists, you resolve the act which instructs you to proceed to R1. Okay, well, if you have five uh, cultists, then is the, the fifth cultist thing, worth it? If Four the fifth five. cultist, maybe. Fourth, probably That's, not, then. Yeah. I mean, like, it really, it really depends how sure you are you can get them. Yeah. Like, if it's a sure thing, mm. I, I think it's worth it. If there's any risk that you might fail and then end up just losing time anyway. Yeah. I, I agree yeah, with Travis, the, though. Eat the punishment and not there's get the There's always a risk, but... Yeah. Uh, and I agree with Travis... Getting the fourth is definitely not worth it. The difference between three and four and the extra time you're going to be behind anyway. So just get out of there. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm greedy, so. <laughs> Maybe it makes sense why Bryn always dies in a <laughs> bowl if he's just like, I could do this. It's all good. I got this. <laughs> uh, all right. So before we move on to the city, let's talk about the other cultists. And I'm just going to zoop, put these guys over here and say goodbye. Okay. So there are five unique cultists that you can face uh, they show up randomly, but you can generally prepare for them when you know who they are uh, and how to beat them. So first one is Wolfman Drew, which you really can't plan for. <laughs> so you just have to kill him. Like, he's the one that you just have to beat the crap out of. He is also probably, I think in all of our runs, Wolfman Drew is usually the one that makes it out alive. More often yeah. than not. He also he seems probably, to be like one of the ones that spawns last, kind of, though. It is. It, it could be because of that, and it's just my bias confirming it. Um, yeah, he, do, he does also have this, uh, unlike the other cultists, it's very difficult to spend two actions moving to him and then, like, one round him. Yeah. Or one 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 action. Solve him with one action. It, it will cost you two, at yeah. least. He does. He also lives in the graveyard, which isn't really connected to anything. He's, on, he's, he's, he's downtown. downtown. He's yeah. downtown. Downtown, yeah. really? Yeah. Graveyard guy's money guy. Yeah. Yeah. A, I think a big thing that also with Wolfman Drew when he shows up is you've already you've, you're going to be spending a lot of your fighting resources and time in the Masked Hunter, so it makes him a bit harder. And the fact that he's healing, if you're just like getting one shot on him, like Bryn said, with all these other cultists, it's a lot easier to just move in and deal with with one action. He's going to take the most time, so. If you get him, you're going to want to be dealing... Like, if you can kill him in two attacks, do that. Just do it. Don't give him time to heal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, you, if you're ever in a, at a point where he's he starts healing himself, you're probably better off just trying to run away from him and get the other cultists. Yeah. All right. Here's the guy at the graveyard, Herman Collins. So his is choose and discard four cards from your hand, parlay, add them to the victory display. So... With these other cultists, the option is you can fight them or it gives you another course of action to defeat them. So this one is just discard four cards from your hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just you just have to give them what they want. Yes. Um, I don't know I don't know what discarding cards from your hand represents, is relative yeah. <laughs> to things, but 
He just wants to know. bury, like, you discard Leo DeLuca, and he buries Leo yeah. DeLuca in the graveyard. Um, so this one, it's pretty easy to prepare for, especially if you, uh, you know that there's a chance that he can show up. You could just be like, I'm keeping these cards. Just in the back of your mind, be like, I'm going to keep some of these cards. Maybe I don't commit them. Maybe I don't play them. I keep my doubles that I normally would, that are normally useless that I do for skill tests, but now I keep them for in case Herman Collins shows up. However, as Travis was saying, this is the guy who's most out of the way. Uh, so let's just quickly pull up Graveyard because it is relevant to him because he's probably the only reason you're going to go into the Graveyard. Uh, not entirely. There's a lot of clues there, and it's very easy to get them. That is true. Mm -hmm. So um, the Graveyard does have things going for it. Yeah, but like it's difficult if you empty the Graveyard is, early because you want those easy yeah. clues, and then like you're yeah, I gotta go to the hospital to get the other person, and then he spawns. You're kind of like, hey. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of, it's a big commitment in time. Uh, so after you enter the graveyard, you test brain three. If you fail, you must either take two horror or move to Rivertown. And Rivertown is the only location connected to the graveyard. As Bruno was saying, low shroud, a lot of clues. So it'll really help you um, getting to uh, yeah. the objective. And it also gives you some victory if you get all the clues off of it. However, as Travis was saying, it feels really bad to get the clues off of this, leave, and then have to go back for Herman Collins. So it can be a viable thing, and we have done it, where we wait for Herman Collins to show up, then have someone go in with their cards, usually uh, our purple character or our red character, uh, because they have higher willpower. Blue also could, they, there's some characters with that. Um, and then they spend the cards, grab the clues, and get out of here. So it is not a bad idea, to potentially wait for Herman Collins to show up. Yeah, unless unless you've got like a purple investigator or somebody with a very high brain score. Yeah. Who, in who, which case, moving moving in and out of the graveyard doesn't have so much of a cost. Yeah, a lot less scary, definitely. Yeah. Okay, let's go to our next cultist, who is Peter Warren, the occult professor. So he's at the Miskatonic University. His action is spend two clues, parlay, add Peter Warren to the victory display. So yeah, you're going to be gathering clues for the objective. Um, or you can spend them on this. So here's the question. I'm just going to be grabbing the Miskatonic University. But if you want, you guys want to take it for new players, should they spend clues on this? Or should they, if the goon is available, go and kill this guy? Because his this, stat this, is a lot lower. Yeah, this, man, this man's fight score is two. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I've ever paid him off. Yeah, yeah so, like I think uh, it's a little bit situational. Like when you're playing on lower player counts, two clues is like... If you're playing with one player, then two clues is a full cultist spawn, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and it represents a lot larger percentage of your actions. But if you're playing with, like, four people, two clues is nothing. Mm -hmm. um, especially yeah. since you're going to have people be able to suck up clues easier. Um, also, with more players, you're going to be spawning more acolytes and other things that need to get done. And, like, presumably you'll be also spawning... Uh, more like guys if you're slanted towards clue gathering like what you probably should be yeah um and your goon will have other things potentially to do mm -hmm. yeah i usually just kill this guy because you know you'd like you toss a vicious blow into it and he's done yeah yeah and also uh, yeah, i think but the i point can see is, like, i can see the worlds where you'd want to spend the two clues yeah it really yeah depends. like it's easy to kill him but like you mm -hmm. don't always want to yeah it, it kind of yeah. just depends on how your resource is going is he's especially great to show up later and then you're like, we don't have time to spawn another guy. Let's just spend the clues and get out of here, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, he's. It, it actually does the, um, like the cadence of the scenario really does change depending on the order in which the cultists show up. Because um, normally you can get one, two, usually two before the masked man spawns, at least spawned. Not in three players as much. It's a bit harder for us, but... Uh, with let lower player counts, less stuff is thrown on the board. Uh, yeah. And, yeah, and lower player counts, it's also a whole lot easier to rack up the clues you need. Yeah. Um, Miskatonic University, get out of here, clues. <laughs> well, wrong one. So this one is just a shroud of four. Uh, six clue, oh, sorry, two clues per player. I, I default to playing three players, so I just do the math in my head for three. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I've definitely done that. Even playing like true solo, I'm like dump a bunch of stuff onto it. No way. Yeah, I did something wrong. 
Uh, that, yeah, that actually happened to me. The first time I played Midnight Mask solo, I put enough clues for three people out of impulse, impulse and I was like, wow, this is so easy. What's going on? Oh, <laughs> I cheated. So search the top six cards of your deck for a tome or spell card and add it to your hand and shuffle your deck. Uh, for your spellcaster or Daisy, who cares about tomes, or someone else that cares about tomes, this is a good place to do that if you don't have other ways. Uh, with that said, when you're building your decks, you're going to want to actually aim for your deck to be doing this for you. Uh, but don't feel like it's a bad thing to do this action. It's here, and it's a good action. It's worth yeah. the time. Yeah, if you, can, if you can abuse it, then why not? Cool. Uh, we'll get to like the location of the map after we get through these cultists. All right. Flip them face down. Victoria DeVroe. North side, spend five resources, parlay, add her to the victory display. I think apart from maybe the nurse, which we will get to, Victoria is probably in the long term of this scenario the easiest one to deal with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've definitely bought off Victoria Devereaux more often than I think I've paid any of the other cultists. She's the money one? Yeah, she's just the money one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, you're spending your time, like, going around just trying to do the objective. You're not spending your resources trying to uh, set up an engine or anything. So you just end up with a pile of resources, and you're like, here you go. Yeah. Shove them in your face, and yeah. she's like, okay, bye. And I think She's also not that hard to kill, but paying her off is just quicker and often yeah. easier. Yeah. And uh, there's two potential downtown tiles cards you can get, uh, which is Heal Through Horror or Gain Three Resources. Um, this with, if you get this one, you're like, okay, I'm just going to stop there if I'm short on resources and pick them up for her. It's kind of just built into it and they're, they're next door to each other in the locations. Um, I think spending, like you can fight her, but spending the resources is so much easier. Cause like Travis was saying at this point in the scenario, when she shows up, it's likely there's someone who already has these resources just sitting there. Um, one thing about the location she spawns is it has spend five resources, gain two clues from the token pool. This does seem like a lot of resources to do both of these things in the game, but you are likely going to have the resources to do it because this scenario is quite long and you need to act so much in this scenario. You have to be so aggressive and ensuring that the game isn't playing you, but you are playing the game to that you're going to have more resources than other scenarios because you're going to be spending so much time getting clues, defeating cultists, and moving around the board. And five resources for two clues is really, it's like a very great exchange rate. It is pretty solid. Yeah. All right. Especially if you're like playing this with just the core set and your green characters, cards are garbage and don't want to play them anyway. It's true. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Ruth Turner. Uh, after she's evaded, add her to the victory display. If you have someone who can evade, she is... She's chill. Uh, however, if you have someone with a weapon, like say you're playing with a non-mutated or non-tabulous machete, she goes down like a she, sack of potatoes. Like, she just... Oh, yeah. She only... she Again, she only has two fight. Yeah. So... But... you can You can always just murder her. She's uh, yeah, like the the four uh, health is a little more awkward than the three because you can't just one shot with a vicious blow. Yeah. You probably take two actions, but that's not too bad. But yeah, if you don't if you don't have someone who's specialized enough to evade the five, that's okay too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, cool. Yeah, there's not much to say about her. She's just you just deal with her. Like she's she's simple. Yeah, you just do it. I think it actually went in order of which I like to see them. <laughs> in the way we revealed them. So good job, Tabletop Simulator. You killed it. All right, let's look at these last few locations. Let's start with Rivertown. So this is where you're going to start in the game. It has a Shroud of One with two clues. So get those clues off that location. ASAP, uh, because it will matter. It matters especially, which we will get to when we get to these Mythos cards, for your people, your clue getters, who have less health. They're going to want to always have a backup clue with them. Uh, your goon will probably also want to pick up clues, so this location is probably a good place for them to get clues, just in case. Or yeah. you can just 
risk it. You'll see when we get to that card later, and we'll come back to this whole topic. Yeah, this uh, this location, it might it might be best to not have your yellow character or you know, whoever's investigating for your team grab the clues. You might want to leave them for somebody with a lower intellect score. Yeah. Uh, so we're talking about the graveyard, Miskatani University. Uh, these two, pretty simple. Uh, one of them gives you victory. So honestly, like, it's a bit harder, but you kind of do want to, like, it, this one does make it easier, but getting victory is sweet. Uh, these are random, though, and there's really, like, just, you're going to get them. You're going to get one of them. Uh, East Town. Uh, while you're in East Town, reduce the cost of each ally asset you play by two. This one is always going to be here. Um, so if you know that you have an ally asset and your player want, you want to play, uh, taking the one action to move from here up to East Town is essentially uh, two-thirds of uh, emergency cash. So it's worth it. It also saves you money to pay off what's her face. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Victoria Devro. Um, all right, uh, St. Mary's Hospital, uh, heal three damage li limit once per game. So unlike the horror one, this one's always here. And uh, the shroud is pretty low, so yeah, don't really know what else to say about that one. We have two south sides. One is draw three cards, limit once per game. And the other one is search your deck for an ally asset and add it to your hand, shuffle your deck. The draw three cards one is really nice because this also helps with Herman Collins. Um, mm -hmm. Searching for an ally can also be very strong. Yeah, especially at the start of the game. If you, you have an ally you're really wanting to get out there, like say maybe Leo DeLuca, it's worth the time to just move, move down here, get him, and then play him, and then do something else, assuming that you have the upgraded one. That being said, yeah. there's a lot of cases where like you are under pressure to get things done in this game, and it's probably not worth your time to go... like to this location to tutor up your Leo de Luca and then also move to the location. It's like you play your allies for two less. Oh yeah. yeah you I, probably I agree don't want to yeah. be trying to do both of those things. Yeah. That's uh, unless you don't need the ally and play right away. Yeah. But if you don't need the ally and play right away, these are things that like are good to do if they're convenient, but yes. like yeah. you don't need to really go out of your way yeah. for them. Uh, like I think the search is definitely worthwhile. If the person you're finding is Leo, uh, or if you're finding I mean, like, Dr. Leo Milan. specifically, because he just pays you back the actions yeah. relatively uh, fast. Yeah, like if, you, if you're finding him, if you're finding Dr. Milan, if you're playing a blue character and you don't have something you need to do on turn one and you're just going here to find your beat cop or your guard dog or what have you, yeah, um, that's a pretty okay plan. I think uh, going on with what Travis was saying, something that I, I see, when, I've played this game with a lot of new players, and I, the thing that I would recommend most to new players is... You have to get your you have to get yourself set up really quickly. Like don't like after so many turns in the game, just accept that unless it's will help you win the game like immediately, sometimes it's better to just accept that you're not gonna be able to play that card. Like in the scenario yeah, like, Oh, you go Travis. If it helps you just how much doom is on the the agenda is ten, right? It's eight. Six and eight. Six and eight, so fourteen total. Yeah. That means that, like, for each player in the game, you have, like, what, 42 actions in this scenario at most. So you really have to ask yourself, like, how much. And, like, keep in mind that playing cards is an action, moving to new locations is an action. Like, how much is this really worth one of those actions, what you're going to do? Yep. And especially once we get to the Mythos deck, how much... This, this scenario adds so much pressure, and it, like... It'll really throw you back. So this one, if you want to get those four, five, or six cultists, you need to be incredibly action efficient. Now let's look at this card that we've like only played with once in our joke <laughs> campaign. Uh, yeah. Your house in the middle of the street. Just kidding, it's in the corner. Uh, so okay. let's say you didn't kill the ghoul priest in the gathering. And if you haven't killed the ghoul priest in the gathering, go back to my previous video where I talked about it. The advice uh, is really simple. I just said, like, you have to kill him, right? Like, just, he is the boss fight. Yeah. Save your resources for him. You don't want this guy showing up in Midnight Masks. That's going to be such an abysmal time if he shows up. Yeah. Like, if you can kill him at the cost of getting, like, one less cultist, it's not awful. But It's true. Yeah, if so, yeah, yeah I, think, like, I think what Travis... Yeah, I'm going on that further. If he is still here, and you have the choice between between grabbing one more cultist 
or killing the ghoul priest, you kill the ghoul priest. Yeah, the ghoul priest is also worth more victory than any of the cultists are, and the ghoul priest uh, may or may not continue to show up <laughs> if you don't kill. Um, so the thing that uh, your house does is it gives you an additional, uh, sp uh, some more clues, one per player. And it also has the action, draw one card and gain one resource, which is, if you're going to be doing that, this is the place to do it. However, as Travis was saying, you only have 42 actions. Is this really per worth player. it? Right? Yeah, per player. Uh, honestly, I think maybe once and even then, I think there's just better things out here to get the things you need if you're looking for something. Yeah, it's also worth noting that if you that you will begin the game at your house instead yes. of a Riverton. Yeah. Which means that you're going to have to spend another action to move from your house to Riverton before you start actually playing the game. That's an excellent point as well, yes. So there is that. Uh, I think if you have your house and it's still in play, you have to be abusing the fact that it does let you draw cards and gain resources at a very efficient rate, a very favorable rate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we loved that when we had it. We were just, we yeah. sat here for like three turns. We were like, give me the resources. Yeah. Like, like it's cool, but it does also cost you. Like, it costs you tempo. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so it's whether whether that's worth it to you or not. Which is a magical word that doesn't really mean anything. But. <laughs> um, before we go on to the actual individual uh, Mythos deck, uh, just some stuff to be aware of of this map. Even though this is just a 3x3 three three box, the connections are limited. So Rivertown goes to the graveyard. Graveyard only goes here. Likewise for the, your house, they only connect like this. This one connects here, uh, but uh, Rivertown does not connect to downtown or uh, north side, so you need to go around to go like this. That's correct, right? Yeah, it is. I think so, yeah. And then it also does not connect to St. Mary's Hospital. So this, uh, these kind of areas, uh, downtown and St. Mary's Hospital, are the most out of the way. Same with also north side. Just something to be aware of. This is going to become especially relevant when we get to certain Mythos cards, which uh, let's dive into now. Uh, we'll start with the one that makes this relevant, which is uh, on the Wings of Darkness. So this is the Night Gone set. Uh, so test foot four. If you fail, take one damage and one horror. Then disengage from each non-Night Gone enemy engaged with you and move to a central location. So the only central location is Rivertown. So it's very likely that you will take damage and be reset here throughout the game. So Which is just, sometimes nice. It's true. You can actually turn that into a positive. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes it is a good thing. Yeah. Uh, the foot four is very high. There's a lot of times that we see this and we're just like, well, guess I'm moving to Rivertown, right? Um, mm -hmm. But it's exactly that. This is it. Uh, this is something that you can adapt into your game plan if you're kind of thinking a few steps ahead, right? You're like, okay, I'm going to come back or someone else can deal this and now I can deal with this problem. Because, I mean, that can move you, like, two spaces. Like, look at that. That's two actions at the cost of one damage and I, one I would take I would take a damage to take an extra action almost any time. And maybe that's why I don't survive so much, but... <laughs> yeah, like, um, I do that a lot of times. Probably less than Brandon, but that's, yeah. like, a good deal. It's a very good deal. Yeah, like, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty good deal. Like, like Travis was saying, you only, you only get like so many long. actions in a scenario. Yep. Uh, then we got the Hunting Night Gaunt. So this guy has three attack, four health, one foot. Wow, he's so easy to evade. Just you wait. Hunter, while attempting to evade him, double the negative modifier of each revealed chaos token. So this is like, uh, apart from the cultist, when this guy shows up, he actually can be a pretty big... Like, he's probably like the big challenge of this game outside of our uh, cultists. Uh, evading him actually seems easy, but it can get... Really tricky. Your minus yeah. ones are now minus twos. Your minus twos are now minus fours, right? You can only, like, if you have four foot, which is normally a very good score for evading, you can only beat a minus one. Yeah. That's it. Uh, and so, and then also in this now, like, if you just look at the tokens we have in here, the minus two is a minus four. The tablet's a minus six. This minus X could is, like, minus two X now, yeah. right? 
Could be so much. Uh, one thing to also be aware of, this minus two, place one doom on the nearest cultist enemy, that can be, that can sometimes really throw you out. Or it could be something to, that you just are like, well, I was going to deal with this cultist anyway. But it is something you should be aware of when you're drawing. And then on this note, I didn't actually talk about this in gathering, uh, in my gathering guide for this, but the concept of making tests, um, I feel like Travis could be really good of what you're aiming for when it comes to a test in terms of what's in the Mythos Cup and how much higher you should be for it. Uh, two to three, depending on the campaign. Yeah. It's, for uh, this one, it's usually two. Yeah. yeah. It also it also varies depending on the scenario as well. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, basically, just on what your what your symbol tokens do. If there's one of them that's particularly rough, you will obviously want to be a little bit further ahead. Yeah, like yeah, the, you know, it's not a lot, especially with the layer that. campaigns. Like the Dreamlands, there are a lot of times where like, you know, I have to be testing at least a three up because if I get this token, it'll just like it'll crush me like i can't not fail on that yeah uh likewise with this one the uh minus three there's only one of these in the token cup um but it could really like if you're like you, you don't want to be just like doing an action that doesn't matter when a token like this could really hurt you right like yeah like before you start a campaign take a look at your mythos thing and like the two important things to note are like what your what you think the sort of average negative modifier is. And again, I think it's usually two or three. And then also what like the low or the highest possible negative modifier is. Like where you know you can't fail unless you get the tentacle chip. Yeah. Other than that, it doesn't really matter what's in the cup. Yeah. Yeah, it's also important to note the frequency that the symbol tokens will show up at. Yeah, that's but. also yeah okay it doesn't actually it's not actually because of what they what they do or anything it's just to be aware of like it's more likely that i'll draw a skull than than a tablet or yeah sometimes like, you have cards that care about that especially right. yeah mm -hmm. and it also helps you figure out what the odds are of it's the math part of the game right that's right board games are filled with math your teacher yeah you can make this game like really boring actually <laughs> <laughs> yeah like when you really strip it down like Everything's the same thing in this game, but the flavor makes it so good. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's talk about uh, the scenario cards themselves. So false lead. If you have no clues, false lead gains surge. If you have one or more clues, test book four. For each point you fail by, place one of your clues on your location. So the only time this one kind of sucks is like when your clue getter is a purple character. Because either in most scenarios, either the person who is getting clues who could potentially put them back is probably going to have a high book score. Yep. And then your people who don't have a high book score aren't going to be getting the clues, so who cares? Like, yeah. what are you going to do? Yeah, like, the other the other part of this is don't stockpile your clues. Just, yeah, yeah, just spend them. As soon as you can reasonably spend them to spawn a cultist, you might want to keep keep one-ish around, just, just in case. Or one something the other two that's actually cards. in this set. It's like probably the one below this. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it is this one. Uh, don't don't end up with a giant pile of clues. Yeah, I think that's it. And that's basically what this one means. Yeah, and that's even like going into just the like you have your you're, you have a limited number of actions. You don't want to like be like I could either spawn a cultist or uh, draw a card, right? Like. Like, unless you're, like, progressing the game state by investigating to grab clues or fighting and killing an enemy, spawn a cultist. Even with that said, I think in terms of order of importance, spawning a cultist even beats sometimes just grabbing more of those clues because something like this exists. Yeah. This, this card does, like, you do want to have everyone with a reasonable book score have a clue as often as you can because this card is basically dead if somebody draws it and they only have one clue. Like, what's it going to do? Yeah. The same thing as drawing the tablet shit. Yeah, happened? each one action. Who cares? Yeah, no, no big deal, right? You can you can live with that as if that's if that's your mythos card. Uh, not so bad. So when we were yeah. talking about how you want certain characters to always have at least one clue on them, um, this is kind of the protection for that. So it's revelation. Uh, you must choose to either spend one clue or take two damage. This also has peril, 
which means uh, the person can't ask for help. They just have to deal with it. Um, there are times when it's better to take the damage, and there are times when it's better to spend the clue. And this is just something that if you are, for example, running out of uh, physical damage on your character, you're going to want to save a clue just in case, because it's better to not die than die. Exactly. Dead, dead characters take no actions. Yeah. <laughs> so losing one action to keep somebody in the game. Yeah, especially also because, like, say you're playing with three people. If someone dies early in the campaign, yes, you're drawing less Mythos cards, but that's actually not too big of a deal because the majority of Mythos cards you can deal with individually or, like, it spawns an enemy. But the game is still expecting you to get an output of actions out equal to the number of players that started the game. So if you lose someone early on, like, you lose all those actions that the game still expects you to make up. Mm -hmm. It will be very difficult. From wow, there there's out. three of these? Whole, there's yeah. three of each of them. Uh, okay. um, yeah. No, there's two the of these and three of this one. Wow. So the yeah. Haunting Shadow is uh, very rough if you draw two of them early and can't pay for either of them. Yeah. Okay, let's start looking at these enemies. Uh, we're going to do Mysterious Chanting last. Wait, you want to talk about the cultists first before we talk about the cards that pertain to cultists? Oh, I know. What, what a what a crazy guy I am. So, Wizard of the Order, you know, let's talk about the Acolyte first. Get out of here. So, <laughs> this guy's the basic dude. So, in the last, in the gathering, you were dealing with ghouls, which uh, basically were just there to get punched. Like, that was the purpose and the design of those ghouls. It's just here to eat actions without providing more of a threat than just the idea of a monster on the board. This, this scenario introduces the Acolyte, which not only represents a threat on the board in terms of the damage it can deal and the actions it takes to eat up, but it also places Doom on it, and each Doom on the board represents a potential loss of three actions per player. So they yeah, may look... That's bad. Yeah, that's bad, exactly. They may look like they're just here having a good time, but they can really, if you ignore them, and just be like, this is not a problem it will become a problem very quick, especially in this scenario where it's all about time. Fortunately, yeah, this... these guys do only have one health, and they're very easy to, like, sort of cheese, especially if you're playing with more than just the core set. Yeah. Or even if you're just playing with a blue character, like, Beat Cop takes this guy down without even requiring an action on your part. Same with Guard Dog. Yeah. Yeah, like, when we were talking about uh, things that you're monster killer might or your goon might be doing instead of killing cultists this is them they're killing different cultists it's just <laughs> garbage ones though yeah yeah they're killing these guys because every doom you remove from the board is an extra act like extra turn you get to take as a team yep yep um even if your goon has to spend three actions getting this guy like that means your other two players still get there it is it is still a net game yep and so in the last gathering they had the rats which i when I was explaining that to uh, the viewers, I said that the rats essentially represent one action loss, right? Like, they are not a threat. It's a one attack. They're just an action that you have to eat up the majority of the time. The Acolyte steps that a bit further. It does have three attacks, so it's a lot harder for, say, like your three attack, uh, someone who has three attack or like two attack to take out, um, which makes them a bit more of an engaging and a lot more interesting enemy. Uh, so just like, it's kind of just cool, so as you as the, uh, the players of this game can kind of see the difference for where these guys come from. Acolyte is played in a lot more campaigns and scenarios than Rats for this very reason. It is like the quintessential enemy in this game. Yeah, he'll be your good friend. And then we have Super Cultist. So That's exactly what this guy is. Yeah. Uh, where the this guy just places once when he's on him. Uh, this guy um, will place one uh, Doom on him every Mythos phase, so that will add up and become a much bigger threat. Uh, with a weapon that deals plus one damage, this guy is pretty easy to get rid of, um, but his four attack does make it so that it pretty much falls into the place, the hands of the player who has the weapon that can deal the additional damage. Uh, he also will come back if the deck is shuffled, so you're probably going to kill him two times, maybe three if you're having a really rough one in this scenario. Mm-hmm. He does also have Retaliate, and the difference between 4 and 3 fight is quite large. Yep. 
<clears throat> uh, one thing yeah, to note... like the difference for that is like your goon, your blue character probably has four punch, and then Machette gives him plus one. That puts you five, which means you're plus two on the three. Uh, for the cultists, which, as mentioned earlier, is kind of where you want to be for most of your tests, yep. at least in this scenario. Whereas being at four mm-hmm. puts you even with your fight, your own machete, you're only at plus one. Yep. Yeah, so you're gonna you're probably going to want to have another card that will increase your fight score um, before you start looking at fighting this guy. Yes. Or like a gun. Or a gun. Uh, and this is also where we um, look at what we were saying earlier, how, like, why like Wolfman Drew is a little bit of a harder cultist is because your goon is going to have so many other things he needs to clean up. Your other players can grab those other cultists, but Wolfman Drew says, fight me, fight me, right? Yeah, fight me or die. Uh, another thing that's relevant is these guys spawn in empty locations. So if there's no empty location, you might not know this rule, but they do not spawn, in which case you feel like the happiest person in the world. Well, yeah, it's also kind of means that the game's kind of a shit show on this map. But yeah, yeah. So there's one, two, three, there's four, five, six, too. seven, eight locations. There's at least eight. Yeah. So you have Sometimes four players, nine. four other people yeah. out. Who knows? Okay. Mysterious chanting. So, place two doom on the nearest cultist enemy. If there are no cultist enemies in play, search the encounter deck and discard power for a cultist enemy and draw it. So if you have cultist enemies in play, this represents two doom on them, which is now... As we were saying, not great because if this can uh, if this advances and you can't deal with it, uh, you lose so many actions. Uh, with that said, this can show up late in the campaign and really ruin you. This has happened to us where put a cult uh, doom on a cultist we couldn't reach, and we were like, I guess we have to resign, right? Um, mm-hmm. And with stuff I don't like- remember that, but. <laughs> Uh, no, I, th- I think this one was mostly, it was mostly on that horrible Shattered Aeons run. Yeah. Uh, which one? <laughs> uh, yeah. But yeah, um, the, the two Doom that it represents can be really bad, and it's also the point where this is why, like, even though these guys seem small and you can ignore them, this scenario specifically says, no, you cannot with this card. I mean, these sets always come together, so they always say that, but I'm just specifying this scenario for you guys at home. Mm-hmm. Uh, if yeah. there's no cultists, it spawns a cultist, um, which, uh... It should always be an acolyte. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, don't... If you have the choice, don't ever pick the wizard. So, what's re- uh, also relevant is that these... All of our bros over here, these guys are also all cultists, so they can also take it. Mm-hmm. Which could be particularly scary if it's on someone like, say, Wolfman Drew or the Masked Hunter. It just puts the pressure on. You obviously want it on the Masked Hunter, if you can, because you're planning on killing him anyway. And he shows up really yeah. early. Like, if you're in turn yeah, six of the new round, and you haven't killed the Masked Hunter yet, it might be... You might be in over your head, and a resign button might be what you want to press soon. Yeah, the downside to it being on the Masked Hunter is that it's very, very difficult to kill him the round that he gets the extra Doom. Yes, because it does pump up their jam. No, it's no. just uh, he has so much health. Oh, okay, then yes, yeah, that's fair. Yeah, he's got four plus two per investigator. But he does show like, up. Sometimes it's really easy, though. You just put on Victoria, and you're like, here's your money. Oh, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes, yeah. And, like, sometimes it is also very easy, yes. That's where, like, why this game also is so fun, beyond just being uh, reaching into a bag and drawing chits for the majority of the game, <clears throat> is because the way it can all stack out, you could get interactions like that, which are a blast. You're like, wow, this is easy. Okay, what's next? Let's go to locked door. There's only two of them, and they're both the locked door. Attach the location with the most clues without a locked door attached. The attached location cannot be investigated. Test fist or foot four to break the door or pick the locks. If you succeed, discard locked door. You know, looking through all these cards individually, this is such a well-designed scenario in this game. Like, if you take it piece by piece, like, this stops your clue getters from getting clues, and they need your goon, more often than not, to come and stop what they're doing to break the door down, or the seeker now has to look for new clues to get. Mm -hmm. But you can have someone put it open. Yeah, that's true. uh, It is also worth noting that it doesn't say that the clues can't be discovered, only that they can't, the location can't be investigated. So if you have somebody like Roland on your team, yeah. Yes, Maybe you don't even need things. to deal with this, yeah. Um, it, so, in the uh, base game, 
if you're just playing with the core set, they recommend you play with Roland and Wendy. <clears throat> Locked door won't be a big problem for them for the reason Brinstead and for the reason Travis said. Like if you have five foot, you can just also pick the lock. Um, but if you don't have those things, like if you're, if you're playing two players and one person's fighting and one person's getting clues <clears throat> and you have a low foot score, this could be a little bit of a problem. Uh, but also you could just be like, it's okay to walk away from a location and come back later. There's nothing wrong with that, and it won't make you fall behind. In fact, it'll make sure you're staying ahead because you're still being efficient with your actions. Good old locked door. Okay, last one. We got the uh, chilling whatever this one is called. We have obscuring fog. Attach your location, limit once per location. Attach location gets plus two shroud. After attach location is successfully investigated, discard obscuring fog. So if we just look at our shrouds, there are some locations where this could be pretty bad, right? These ones. There's some where the locations are just kind of a little bit more difficult. And then there's some where you're like, oh, this ain't a problem at all. This is just something that your clue getter is going to have to deal with when it comes. In a perfect world, you get it on Rivertown on like the first turn and then you're like, okay, I'll just gain a clue and keep playing the game. Yeah. Or, uh, or you draw it and you're standing on a location with no clues left. Yes, oh. Or you then draw it. Then you just don't it. even have to care about it. Yeah. Or you draw it and there's already an obscuring fog on your location. And you're like, whoa, I basically just got a free, like, ward of protection. It's great. I didn't even have to take the horror. So, yeah, this card's pretty soft. You don't have to really, like, this will show up. And unless, like, even, like, if it throws you, like, for a loop and puts it on one of these locations... Uh, honestly, these locations are probably behind a locked door anyway, so don't even worry about it for a bit. Uh, and the last one on this set is Crypt Chill. Test Brain 4. If you fail, choose and discard one asset you control. If you cannot, take two damage instead. This one can suck sometimes. Yeah, this one it can, can really... Yeah, it can really suck sometimes. Um, but this one is uh, probably the first... One of the first things encounter sets where it becomes clear that you want to have cheap assets that you don't care about mm -hmm. because they protect the important ones like your leo de luca yes or even just assets that like have uses like flashlights you yeah. can just toss yeah yeah if you have if you have an empty gun or an empty flashlight or even something dumb like a smoking pipe yeah like it, uh, you do want it for reasons but if you discard it it's not the worst thing ever this is also where something like a uh, cherished keepsake and uh, leather jacket, leather coat, yeah. yeah, leather coat come in play, uh, because those are essentially now the card just says if you fail, take two damage or two horror, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if you rely on an asset, as I often do when we play this game, <laughs> it's usually dark horse. Yeah. Wait, who said that? You're gonna want to. Uh, Make sure you have a plan for this. And maybe, if you have nothing else, don't play your single lone important asset out until you have something that you can do to protect it. However, if you need it to win or get your machine going, you might just have to risk it and then mm -hmm. just pass the test. The Travis yeah, thing, I just mean, don't exactly. fail. Exactly, that's... Uh... That thing that you can do to protect it might just be commit guts or unexpected courage. Yep. Yeah, just just pass. Yeah, that's the just don't. Is that the, is that the last one from that set? I thought this one had. Uh... No, just two of these. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I thought that set had uh, frozen in fear as well. No, that's a. Uh... What's it's not? So... That's the one with dissonant voices too. I think. Yeah, striking oh, oh, fear. Okay. I think that's that's what's called. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that's um. No, my bad. That's a uh, uh, Midnight Masks. This scenario is fantastic. Uh, and it's really fun and really stressful, but like in a good way. Uh, and I hope this guide has helped you kind of see what you can do and how you can approach it and how you can come out ahead. If anyone's watching this who has played Midnight Masks before and has any further advice that we may have missed, definitely throw it in the comments below. If you like this video, why don't you smash that like button. We're going to be la uh, back to talk about um, the Devourer below very soon. Thanks for watching. Have a good one. And as always, GG's.